it's a pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural session of the lecture series on advancements in geotechnical engineering, from research to practice. AGERP lecture series is an attempt toward disseminating the coupled learnings from academia and industry on some of the key topics in geotechnical engineering. Today's lecture is on mining geotechnology, which will be delivered by Professor David Williams and Mr. Mark Reinhard. Mark is a senior engineering geologist who has 12 years geotechnical experience in Australia and the Pacific, and in excess of 15 years earth science and environmental experience in South Africa. Mark has practiced in the fields of engineering and environmental geology and has provided earth science input for a broad client base. The Australasian and Pacific experience includes field work in remote locations under challenging conditions, including varying proficiencies with geotechnical and hydrogeological field programs. Mark currently provides engineering geological direction to major mining engineering projects and has been involved in senior project management. Okay, um, my name is Mark Reynert and I have been involved uh, with Clone Krippenberger in a tailings dam project in Papua New Guinea that we call Hidden Valley. Um, so Hidden Valley um, is a tailings dam in Papua New Guinea. It's the first large on-land tailing storage facility in the country, um, which makes it fairly unique. And uh, this project's been going now for the best part of a decade, and it's probably got a mine life of another five years. Hidden Valley Mine's located about 210 kilometers um, north northwest of Port Moresby. So this is a map of PNG. Hidden Valley Mine is in red, and Port Moresby is the capital of Papua New Guinea, down on the southern coastline. And um, the Hidden Valley Mine is owned by Harmony Gold. So Harmony Southeast Asia has an office based in Brisbane. And uh, the Hidden Valley um, asset is, is, is one of the, the assets held by um, Harmony Southeast Asia. So the Hidden Valley mine um, consists of two open pits. The one in the bottom right of the screen in orange is called the Hidden Valley Cavaroy. And the one in the top left towards the north northwest is called the Hamata pit. And you will see that uh, the tailings dam is located um, immediately south of the Hamata pit. Um, these two pits are about six kilometers apart, and the waste from a mitre pit is used for constructing the embankments of the Hamata TSF. Um, it's a hydraulically placed tailings operation, and the tailings are about 30% solid by waste, but by weight. So that just gives you a background of where we're at and what we're doing. And what I'd like to do with this presentation, guys, is to um, first give you a very brief outline of of the Hidden Valley Mine and the and the Hamata Tailings Dam, and give you a very basic introduction to the to the design basics of this tailings facility, and then I'd like to switch over to some of the practical issues linked to construction to try put the design in practice. So we we uh, Dave Williams, I think very succinctly described some of the uh, the issues and concerns that tailings engineers need to deal with on a daily basis, and uh, one of the one of the issues with tailings technology that I enjoy is, is every dam site is different. We have completely different ground conditions and every tailings dam has a fairly unique solution to, to manage the conditions that we have to deal with. And, and I hope that this presentation will, will show you how, how KCB has come to terms with the conditions in this Papua New Guinea mine. So um, the previous map was, was a, a schematic. This is, um, drone photographs of the site. So in the photograph on the left, in the foreground, this is the open pit that the ore body um, occurs, the Hidden Valley Cavaroy. In the distant background is the Hamata Tailings Dam. And what's quite interesting at this particular mine is the process plant is not up at the source at the ore body. The process plant is right down at the Tailings Dam. So the ore is mined from this open pit in the foreground. It's crushed up on top of the hill and then it's put into a pipe conveyor belt that winds six kilometers down the hill and discharges at the process plant, which is the photograph on the right. So the ore is transported in a crushed state from source to the process plant and discharged hydraulically into the impoundment. Tailings, uh, an aerial view of the Mata TSF. So this, um, when, when completed, this facility will have about a, a storage capacity of about 40 million tons. It's a cross valley impoundment, there's two Earth embankments, the one on the left we refer to as a saddle dam, and the one on the right is referred to as the main dam. The ultimate crest when this uh, presentation was developed a few years back was RL2000. There has been a dam raise 
um, design proposed since then. The main dam has a, a, an ultimate elevation. The crest will be 145 meters high. Um, and as I alluded earlier, the, uh, the embankments are constructed from waste derived from one of the nearby open pits and starter dam construction commenced at this uh, TSF uh, mid-2007. Uh, so both embankments are constructed using the downstream method. The downstream batters at both embankments generally are three to one. Um, there's a sub-vertical chimney drain, a filter drain in the middle of each embankment, which uh, drains towards the downstream. Um, that filter has a number of functions. Um, obviously, it's uh, the, the key drain um, to, to provide undrained conditions. The seepage drains through it, so there's a permeability requirement. It also needs to be filter compatible to manage um, internal erosion. Um, and then also um, the ability not to retain a, a crack under any form of internal deformation. And um, the chimney drains also been connected to a number of, of finger drains and they discharge to the toe of both embankments. So cross section through the middle of the, um, of the main dam. So I'd just like to show you some of the design logic that's been applied to, to this main dam. So the foundation is non-liquefiable. The upstream is the dark green, which is a, is a low permeability silty sand. You can see the sub-vertical chimney drain structure running through the midsection of the embankment and it's um, constructed along the foundation in the downstream environment where the seepage can discharge into the downstream environment. And then the downstream shell is a gravelly rocky material to provide lateral support with an outer layer of rock armor to meet the um, erosion requirements under the closure condition. And I suppose I should point out that um, the Hamata TSF has been designed in keeping with ANCOLD recommendations. Next slide will show you um, a similar cross section of, of the saddle dam geometry. So the upstream um, is on the left. So the same logic, we have a, a low permeability silty sand in the upstream. We have a filter drain of, um, running sub vertically through the dam and then this buttress on the downstream side. What's interesting in the saddle dam is that the foundation beneath this embankment is liquefiable under the design seismic load. So the embankment has this significant downstream bench in the downstream buttress, which is being designed to provide a cantilever effect. So under a design um, earthquake, when we have complete strength loss in the foundation, the entire embankment is designed to move as a block with um, minimal internal deformation. And you can see that the downstream toes buttressed into a rock ridge, which provides the stability to the embankment. So despite complete strength loss in the foundation, the integrity of the embankment is maintained. And the deformation modeling shows that um, the embankment is safe under a design earthquake load from overtopping risk. So this is an aerial view of the main dam. So in this slide, we can see the main dam. Um, the, the under drain drains through the internal geometry of this embankment and discharges down in the toe in the valley. And this is a waste dump that has been um, placed outside of the dam footprint and buttresses the uh, southern um, flank of the buttress. And as I alluded to earlier, the entire foundation of this main dam embankment has um, been constructed on a non-liquefiable foundation. This is a shot looking um, over the saddle dam. So this is just a you know, photographic um, perspective of the design detail I showed you. This is the ridge line with the um, with relatively undisturbed um, jungle forest on it. And, and this ridge, if, um, if we have a design earthquake and we have complete strength loss of the foundation, the ridge is buttressed the embankment is buttressed in against, against this ridge line. Um, so this is a view looking towards the south. Um, earlier on, right in the beginning of the presentation, I had a, a view from the other side looking towards the north. So in the background up on this ridge, you can see the open pits. That's the source of the ore body. This is the Amata Tailings Dam. And then this is that small borough right next to the Tailings Dam. We refer to it as Amata Pit. And this is the source of the waste material. The waste streams that have come out of this pit have been used to construct the embankments of the TSF. And there is some ore in this pit, which has obviously um, contributed towards the cost models of the operation, offset earthworks against um, 
recovered um, gold. So that's just really um, design 101 for this uh, tailings dam. Some of the challenges that we need to manage during construction to actually implement the design. Um, the Hidden Valley Mines high annual rainfall, two and a half to three meters a year. It's tropical intensity. There's no real wet or dry season. I always joke that the difference between winter and summer is the temperature of the rain. It's seismically active. We've got a seismograph on, on site. Um, steep mountainous terrain, is, you know, with those tropical conditions, the weathering profile is deep. We're using the observation method, which is pretty standard. Um, the owners, Harmony, have um, on-site um, civil engineers that assist with the monitoring and the data collection. And um, some key design compliance criteria include, include dam freeboard um, and seismic stability. So uh, the pond water is geochemically unsuitable for untreated discharge. So um, the dam does not have an operational spillway. So we're in a tectonically active environment with, a, with high rainfall, it's a positive water balance and no operational spillway. So you can see there's a number of, of um, concerns there for any tailings dam engineer. And so in terms of surface water management, um, there's a 3.3 meter freeboard, which is um, designed to be able to store the design flood event. And there's a little bit of fat in that model as well uh, to prevent overtopping. Um, the two ways that um, the freeboard is, is managed is either to, um, on the photograph on the right, to raise the dam crest through earthworks, or secondly, um, through a water corridor to the mill. So you can see, um, if you can see my cursor, you can see there's a, there's a, there's a pontoon pump structure on, on, a, on a barge floating in the impoundment against the, the northern ridgeline. So the mill would pump uh, water out of the pond, treat it until uh, the water quality met environmental discharge criteria, and then they would discharge it into the receiving environment. So there's a combination of both lowering the pond water through water treatment and raising the dam crest through earthworks construction to, to manage the design freeboard. And that design freeboard, as I mentioned earlier, is critical to provide the buffer to be able to um, store the design storm inflows. Uh, construction of the dam is easier said than done. So it's, um, it rains throughout the year and um, the full placement under saturated conditions is impossible. So, so you end up um, with, with the construction methodology that um, tries to delineate work fronts that you can work in wet conditions and dry conditions and this, this um, particular zone of, of the embankment is obviously a fine grained material. It's a silty sand and when it's saturated, it's completely unusable. So the best thing you can do in this particular part of the embankment under the conditions that you can see on the, on the monitor is to step away and do not traffic um, the fill because the fill has lost all its strength. You just rut it and destroy it and, and increase the length of time for rework, delaying the opportunity to get back into this part of the dam and, and, and continue with, with lifts. So these wet conditions create significant challenges. And the next slide is similar. You know, some parts of the dam are drainage depressions. So all the water runs off in ponds in those areas. And the only way you can get into that is to put pumps in there, drain it. Once it's dry, brush off the saturated material and start again. So you need to be able to develop wet and dry construction fronts so that you can keep the workforce active and you can continue to build the dam. Otherwise, you're going to lose that freeboard and then the entire mining operation comes to a halt. You expose the, the whole business model to an unacceptable risk. So one of the um, safety designs that have been implemented and it's driven by um, a TARP and an action response plan is an emergency spillway. So this is an emergency spillway down one of the access ramps um, down the side of the ramp. So should um, the design freeboard start to fall behind, which has never happened yet, then there's an opportunity to cut a slot through the dam crest and connect the pond to an emergency spillway and that way engineer the overtopping risk um, and reduce the operation of a dam breach. So you, 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 uh, we, we've designed these um, emergency fallback solutions to try and manage, manage the risk. And during wet, you know, there's an, an outer shell of rock armor that's required to meet the closure condition and those rocky conditions are more than um, suitable for, for earthworks activity during, during rainfall conditions. Um, as I alluded to earlier, one of the problems when you traffic the dam crest once it's soft and saturated is these deep ruts. So what happens is 
um, you know, 100, 200 mils of that lift has been completely destroyed. So when the weather clears up, you can, you've got to brush that off um, and then recompact to um, um, back to the earthworks specification and start raising the dam again. So if you, if you traffic the dam under saturated conditions, you, um, you're going the wrong way, you're going backwards. And uh, when you get dry conditions, that's the time to make merry. So uh, one of the big challenges that uh, the design engineer has under these conditions is to manage lift thickness. Because now we're at the other, other end of the spectrum and the guys want to smash the dam crest, try um, get ahead of that freeboard target. And now we find operators trying to chase lift thicknesses. So it's a different challenge, but um, a much more pleasant working environment. Um, with a filter drain, the filter drain has very specific widths and thickness requirements. And we've found that um, to achieve it consistently was a challenge and it's one of the more important internal zones on the dam. So we modified a shipping container, put it on a set of skids at exactly the correct width and thickness and it just gets towed by a dozer. So this spreader box application is one of the solutions we've implemented to construct this uh, filter drain through the midsection of each embankment and it works very, very well. And this is also um, an, an activity that can occur during both wet and dry conditions. So in summary, um, we have a design that's not too complex. It's pretty standard. We have a zoned earthfill dam and the waste streams are sourced from a local borough. Um, to manage the, um, the local conditions, we have uh, developed a wet and dry um, work fronts based on, on, on the material types. Um, we find the dry windows are generally short and are often um, mostly constrained to the morning hours. So with that in mind, you tend to reduce the construction fronts to short lengths. Don't prep and construct in a placement front greater of more than about 50 meters in length, because it's important once you start any construction front that you're able to seal it off and close it off before the rains come. And then when the rains come, shut the dam crest off so that the constructed work fronts are not destroyed and relocate the works crews to uh, an, an area that's more conducive to, to the weather conditions. Um, so those placement lots are adjusted. Placement lots must be sealed off and um, it's crucial to keep the construction traffic off the dam. So control of, um, of, of, of visitors, there's often uh, non-TSF personnel wandering around the area and it's crucial that the signage and the traffic control mechanisms are all in place quickly. And um, once everything is well understood and built into the dam, then uh, meeting the design schedule um, becomes a process. And considering that the construction at this particular mine site has been going for, for well over a decade, I think Harmony have got it well under control. And um, despite all the constraints to try try meet um, what is a pretty basic design to try implement it in in very challenging conditions, I think we're making good progress. And um, one thing that, um, you know, Harmony have been really, really proactive on the, on the, on the, on the best practice um, review protocols. We have external reviewers and we have a, um, a review board of international experts. And so far um, the review process is favorable. Um, I sincerely hope that we don't end up being one of uh, David Williams' um, re review projects in future, but at this stage, there's no indications to suggest that, um, that uh, the dam is misbehaving and um, the design and um, construction um, achievement to date appears to be compliant with ANCOLD. So, um, so far, so good. And I sincerely hope it stays that way because when you start looking at uh, David Williams' presentation, it really does start to make you wonder why any of us in our right minds would want to be a tailings dam engineer considering the risk and liability that we're all up for if, um, if we get this wrong. And um, that's it from my side, guys, and happy to answer any questions that you might have from, from your side. Thanks, Mark. Um, so we'll perhaps take the questions now. This one comes so, from Dirk Flutes from Gold Associates Africa, and he is perhaps interested to know why it was decided to construct the back wall on top of the liquefiable material was it due to unavailable was it due to availability of waste rock in the start of life of mine okay Dirk, um what happened there mate was there was an old river channel running through that valley so the geomorphology in png had 
basically most of the valleys are, are, are tectonically controlled. They're structural. They're big. There's a lot of faults in the area. So the, the, the average valley in Papua New Guinea is steep and narrow. So you end up building a, a really high dam wall for very little storage benefit. So one thing geomorphologically that made this site particularly attractive was that it was a wide valley and a flat bottom. Okay. So the initial engineers that got involved, obviously their eyes lit up and they started designing a, band, a dam because the storage to fill ratios were really attractive. But it turns out geomorphologically, the reason for that profile was that there was an old valley in that area that filled with, um, with alluvials. And it's those alluvials that are, um, are liquefiable and they were too deep to remove. So the site was too good to give up and a lot of thought went into trying to see if we could engineer a way around the geomorphology. And this is the solution that we came up with. Okay, so the next question comes from Paul and Paul asked, what is the design seismic acceleration and its return period? So the PGA, um, we've just done a new seismic hazard assessment, Paul and I, off the top of my head, I can't give you all the details, but I think the PGA is 0.8. Okay. Um, the return period, I can't tell you, mate, I'd be guessing, sorry. Um, if you can flick me an email, or I think we'll catch these questions afterwards, I'm happy to come back to you with the details. Um, another question comes from Asutosh Kumar and he asks, any slope stabilization technique that you have adopted for this project? Uh, pretty standard, mate. Um, the, the standard sl uh, slope Ws in 2D and then also um, the internal deformation using FLAC. So while I got you online, you know, the, the, there's nothing really exceptional here about the, about the, um, the operation. We have, uh, we, we're dealing with the, the standard challenges of trying to get an earthworks crew to understand which materials go to which zones. So often you find the wrong material going to going to the incorrect zone and then there's rework and um, and the schedule falls behind. So it's all cons pretty standard earthworks QA, QC constraints. I, I suppose the biggest concern we have here is, 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 is that anomaly that David Williams was alluding to of, of tropical conditions, mountainous terrain, seismically active, high rainfall, deep weathering profile, and then on top of that, a pretty standard raft of earthworks QAQC issues. Thanks, uh, Mark. Before that, I just want to actually appreciate that you are saying the rainfall is 2.5 meter, very high. The earthquake is also 0.8 PGA. That's also really very high value. So obviously what you say, it's a real tough terrain to construct so the tailing dam. And uh, uh, that may be the reason that's why what you are saying all the time, you are providing three meter of uh, that uh, uh, pre-board so that, I, uh, that the water does not overtop during also the seismic activities. Uh, yeah. Then uh, one more thing I had, I could not exactly get, what this material you are using for this chimney drain construction? Are you adding some cement there? Okay, mate, so the... Um... The seismic deformation in terms of the freeboard for the seismic, we've modeled that. So the design storm event would raise the dam by 2.3 meters and we've got an extra meter in the freeboard to, okay. to manage wave run-ups and, and seismic deformation. So we've put a, quite a bit of extra fat in our, in our freeboard. Our freeboard is really conservative to try and manage the, the modeled extras such as um, uh, seismic deformation of the embankment. And that filter is crushed rock. So the high strength granodiorite rock that's sourced from that borrow right next to the dam that is sent through um, a crusher and the sieves are set to a certain um, requirement with a with a really um, a tight um, grading envelope and every 2,000 cubes is, is checked by an on-site laboratory so it's really just a 19 millimeter crushed rock. Okay. The problem we find with a crushed product is the fines content to try consistently achieve an 075 fraction of less than 10% because it's often too, um, the grading envelope is often excessive at the, at the fine end of the fraction. Yeah, so I said, suppose coming to chimney drain, can't I try it even during the rainy season? Yes, it's a, it's a wet weather and a dry weather construction front. Yeah, then coming yes. to the sale of the dam, is it advisable only during dry season? The start of the dam, the start of the dam is all silty sand, so that's only a dry weather construction front. Okay, so but that particularly that fine grained soil, 
are you could could you comp i mean continue the construction during also heavy rainfall i think you're asking if we can construct that fine grain soil when it's when it's wet if yes. that's your question the, the answer yes. is no mate the, the only thing you can do in that fine grained uh, material is okay. to get off it when it's wet it's a dry weather construction front only the, the optimum moisture content uh, doesn't allow you to work with it because it, it saturates and loses its strength very very quickly oh, it's a pleasure guys happy to help out i hope someone uh, enjoyed it